Hello everyone, I'm Jinjinx. I like Monster Hunter and I like math, so here's some Monster Hunter math. Quick disclaimer, in these videos I will explain a lot about math and calculations. However, even if you aren't interested in being able to do the math yourself, being familiar with these different concepts like EFR, elemental damage, hit zone values and motion values are an essential aspect of high level play in Monster Hunter World. When higher level players discuss the game, this is the kind of terminology they will be using and it's very helpful to understand what they mean. Now it is imperative that you understand what EFR, hit zone values and motion values are to understand the rest of this video. Fortunately my past two videos have been about these subjects, so if you haven't seen them yet, click the link at the top right to watch them now. Moving on, in this video I will be explaining how elemental damage works in Monster Hunter World with the assistance of my assistant, Tuna. Hi everyone, I'm Tuna. In this video, we'll be teaching you about how elemental damage works and why it's better on certain weapons. These weapons include things like bows, dual blades, and sometimes even sword and shield. We'll also be covering a few exceptions to the rules. Now, EFR is the end or be all damage stat for a raw elementless damage build, which is the meta for the majority of weapons. However, for bows, elemental ammo on bow guns, dual blades, and to a lesser degree sword and shield, elemental damage is a more important factor. I mean, I've always heard that's the case for those weapons, but why is elemental damage so good on those and not other weapons? I personally prefer raw on my sword and shield. Excellent question, Tuna. The quick and easy answer? Because they hit faster. Gotcha. Thanks for watching, guys. See you in the next one. Bye! But seriously, let's delve into why that's the case mathematically. See, the reason why we had to discuss motion values and hit zone values before discussing elemental damage is because of one simple fact. Elemental damage is flat damage per hit. So, what does that mean? Simple. It means that because elemental damage is flat damage per hit, that means the fast hitting weapons with low motion values perform much better with elemental damage, and conversely they perform poorly without it. For example, every bow arrow or dual blade swing applies this flat damage. This also means that high motion value weapons gain little from the element because they don't hit as fast, and any increase to EFR heavily increases their damage per hit instead. So let's quickly cover the damage formula for elemental damage. Now elemental damage like raw damage rounds to the nearest integer. I have heard from some other testers that elemental damage rounds down, however all the testing I've done personally shows that it always rounds to the nearest integer. You simply add this elemental damage to your raw damage for an attack and that gets your total damage. Now let's cover each of these one by one. First off, the bloat value for element is always 10, so we simply take one tenth of the on-screen element to get our true element. Easy peasy. Next you can see the sharpness modifiers on this chart on screen. As you can see, it's not as huge an increase as it is for Roar. However, coupled with the Roar damage increase from white and blue sharpness, it's still very nice. After that is the critical element modifier which is different for each weapon. So first of all, as a rule of thumb, if you are running elemental damage focused builds, you should always be running crit element set bonus. The one exception to this may be being if you're running elemental charge blade because your files can't crit. Otherwise though, your damage simply isn't good without it. Also worth noting is that the critical boost skill only affects raw damage, so it does not affect elemental damage, these modifiers are set in stone. As you can see, dual blades, bow, and sword and shield have the highest modifiers with bow guns just behind. This is one of the reasons why they end up being the viable choices for elemental damage builds. Next there is the elemental hit zone value. Ignore the star system for this information because sometimes 3 stars means a hit zone value of 30, while other times it means a hit zone value of 15. Instead, just look it up on Honey's Builder. Finally, there is the elemental modifier on some attacks, kind of like an elemental motion value. For the majority of attacks in the game, this is just one. However, some attacks do have other elemental modifiers attached to them. For example, bow arrows have different modifiers depending on the level of charge of your attack. Another interesting one is Greatsword has a variety of elemental modifiers for each attack. Unfortunately, no, this does not make Crit Element Great Soul good, however. It is, however, interesting that these are included, and it is an interesting concept to know, and we'll explain why sometimes your elemental damage ends up being higher than you think it should be. Cool. So I understand how elemental damage works now, but how much better is elemental damage on something like Bow? Well, let's take the training pool as an example and see how this all works out. Let's just compare this KT Thunderbow with the Element Awakened and Not Awakened, otherwise the builds are exactly the same. Also, I used all of your standard food and item buffs mentioned in the EFR video and also used power codings on all of these tests. 
To simplify things, let's just compare the crits of our level 4 shots. The bow without element is doing 42 damage per arrow, while the bow with element is doing 62 per arrow, which is 20 thunder damage and lines up with our calculations. Also, it's important to note that power coatings only affect the raw portion of an arrow. That puts us at roughly 32% of the damage coming from element. That's a decent amount of damage just coming from elemental. However, like I've mentioned before, the pole does heavily favor raw. In fact, only 4 monsters in the game even have any hit zones at all close to this ratio. Instead, let's look at the tier 2 and tier 3 tempered monsters since they are the majority of the endgame grind. The average for them will be roughly 60 to 25. If we apply that ratio instead of the 80-30, we get about 35% elemental damage with power coatings on. Of course, this changes depending on monster hit zone values as well as which bow you use. For example, against Teosha's head, the KT Water Bow will be hitting about 46% elemental damage instead. But this does give you a general ballpark idea of how important elemental damage is on bow. Now, I don't want to clog up the video with too many more calculations, but a ballpark average for dual blades is about 25-30% to elemental damage. Elemental ammo on bow guns is weird, it's actually an 85% elemental damage. And a decent average for SNS is about 30%. And a big shout out to a went over on the Monster Hunter Gathering Hub Discord server for crunching this SNS elemental damage math. Sure, that all makes sense. But what about a comparison between raw and elemental bow? How does that stack up? So let's briefly compare this to an optimal raw bow build with a Sarah Coil Bender. Because if you were going to be doing a raw bow build, that's the one you would use. This bow actually caps at 65% affinity even with an optimal build compared to the last build's 90%. So with power coatings, this one crits for 56 per arrow. 62 isn't that much greater than 56. Is it really that much better? Although, you did say that the pole favors raw. That's correct. So, if we apply the same 60 shot hit zone value to its damage, that drops to 42 per arrow. If we account for affinity in the calculations, then the Thunder Bow is going to be dealing 23.54% more damage than the Raw Bow. Now please keep in mind this is with the Behemoth Armor on console which straight up made raw damage builds 10-15% to better across the board. So on PC, you're probably looking at close to a 30-35% to damage difference. Now, 23.54% may not sound like too much, but as a comparison point, that's roughly the equivalent of using a Rarity 4 Glacial Arrow Bow instead of a Rarity 8 Legiana Bow, which is a big disadvantage to be playing with. Great! I think I got a better understanding on elemental damage. But weren't there some exceptions? Yes, the exceptions. So I feel these are important to cover because a lot of what I've mentioned doesn't always apply in every situation. First off, there is one situation in which Raw Bow beats Elemental Bow in DPS, and that's on Wall Shots. The motion value for Wall Shots is 35, over 3 times higher than your normal max level shots. So Raw definitely wins out here. However, there's only two monsters you can actually spam this against, Nogagante and Bagel, and their meme runs at best. But this is a situation where it wins. Hey Jin, I heard you're a fan of Dragon Piercer, Dragon Piercer, Dragon Piercer, Dragon Piercer, Dragon Piercer. But that's a very long subject explaining why Elemental Bow is a much higher DPS option than Dragon Piercer, and I will be explaining that in a separate video. Another exception is Raw Dual Blades. See, Crit Elemental Dual Blades is the way to go for damage, except against three monster matchups. That would be Nergigante, Kushala Deora, and Behemoth. Those guys have terrible hit zone values for element. So that means that raw dual blades will be dealing about 10 to 20 more damage on a single demon that's compared to element versus them. However, otherwise crit element DBs always win. Now for crit element on sword and shield is a weird exception. See, the 30% of your damage being elemental only applies if you're using the slicey dice playstyle. However, on the other hand, if you're spamming Falling Bash, you should be using a high raw weapon. Because at that point, you only ever have two procs of element during a combo, so you only deal about 15% element or so. However, there is an exception to this. If your EFR is still very high with your elemental weapon, then you may still be out damaging a pure raw option on a Falling Bash playstyle if you're using it against a monster weak to that element. Most notably, the Joe and Rathalos SNS are this case. Now, another case are monsters like Teostra. Because the Sever hit zone values are very low and the Water hit zone values are very high on Teostra, a 55 to 30 ratio, it is possible for something like an Awakened Crit Element of Water IG to out damage a Raw IG on Teostra. However, this is, as far as I'm aware, one of the only examples where Crit Element actually beats Raw on IG. 
All right, well, I'll keep that in mind, but those can't be the only cases. I see you use that Devil Joe longsword a lot. What's up with that? Well, you see, the biggest example of the exception where your EFR is high enough that the elemental damage can push you over is with the meta Hemoth sets on console at the moment. For example, when you compare the Joe longsword versus the Divine Slasher, the EFR difference is only about 832 this is low enough that the dragon damage actually makes a difference. In fact, it basically works out that except against dragon immune monsters like Oda Garon, the Joe Longsword actually beats the Vine Slasher or at least matches it. And this is the case for some weapons like Switch Axe, in some cases it's not. However, now that you are armed with this knowledge, you can make this educated decision yourself. And that about does it. Now that we have equipped you with the knowledge in these three videos, you should have a very good understanding for how damage calculations work in Monster Hunter World. And now you can use that knowledge to deal max deeps. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like the video below. And we have plenty more videos coming in this series, so be sure to subscribe and press the little bell icon down there, and you'll be notified anytime a new one comes out. And if you learned something new or you have some topic you'd like us to cover, be sure to leave a comment below. Happy hunting, hunters! Tuna and I will see you on the next video. Bye!